everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology and in this video I'm going to be talking you through how to write up your required practicals. Now I already have loads of resources out there to help you with required practicals such as this playlist just here which goes through all of the practicals as well as I have a whole summary video on all of the practicals in one place to make life easy for you and I have my active recall workbook which is a book full of questions with the mark schemes to see the sorts of things you could get asked in the exam itself. But I know it's not just the worries about how to prepare for the exam, you actually have to pass the practical endorsement as well. And that means you have to have everything written up in your lab book. So I've created for you a completely free guide that you can follow to know how to write up these lab reports. And I've linked that in the description below. So go and download that. And then I'm gonna talk you through how to use this free guide. So let's get into it. Right, so let me talk you through my free guide to how you can write up your required practicals. Now, the first thing I would like to point out, which I have actually got on the intro page just here is, that what you're being assessed on each time in your required practical won't necessarily be the same competency. And also you might not have to include all of what's in this document every single time. So it is really important to still listen carefully to the guidelines and the instructions from your teachers so you know what is expected for your particular write-up but you can use this free guide as a general guideline and to know what you should include in each section but as I said your school might have particular types of things that they want as well so at my school a general thing that we ask for in all required practicals is you have the date title and you state who you've worked with so that's just general presentation then if we are asking you to do the plan we would expect our students to include the aim, so what you're trying to find out, the hypothesis, which is what you predict you'll find. The null hypothesis is something that you use for statistics. So this is where you state that you won't find a particular pattern. So let's say if we were looking at the effect of pH on enzymes, our null hypothesis would be that pH will have no effect on enzymes. Or if you know you're going to be investigating a correlation, then you'd specifically say that there is no correlation between pH and the rate of enzyme controlled reactions. Next, we have the equipment list and the method. Now, you won't necessarily always have to provide this. You might be given it. And if you do have to give the equipment you'd want to use, you might not be asked to justify your choice. But sometimes we do ask our students to justify why they used each piece of equipment, either written explicitly in their plan or we assess it within the practical themselves. We ask them because that does link to competency too. Then we've got a control experiment. So if it would be applicable or appropriate, then you should have a control experiment. And this is when you set up an experiment exactly the same, but you take out whatever you think is causing the change, so the independent variable usually. And that means basically you're setting up an experiment to check that it is only the independent variable having any effect on the dependent variable. And that takes us into variables that you should include within your plan. So you should be stating what the independent and dependent variable are, how it's going to be changed or how it's going to be measured in the case of the dependent variable. And then control variables, you might be asked to give one, two or three. Again, state what the variable is, how you're going to keep it the same and then also why it's important to keep it the same. So basically, if you didn't control it, what effect might it have on the results? Now, again, the level of detail here is maximum level of detail you could be required to give. You might not be asked to provide that level of detail. Lastly, within the plan then is a risk assessment. So sometimes you might be asked to include the risk assessment. So the risk is basically what it is that could cause the harm. So for example, the roaring flame of a Bunsen burner, that would be a risk. The hazard is what harm that risk could cause you. So in the case of the roaring flame of a Bunsen burner, it could cause severe burns to your skin. Then the last column is to say how you would minimise that risk. Now, it's worth noting that for the A-level risk assessments, you do have to be quite detailed about the hazard and how to minimise the effect. And you're recommended to use things like has cards from Kleeps to give you the correct level of detail for this. Lastly, you might be asked to reference any research that you did to be able to write your plan and just Make sure that when you do reference, you're using the Harvard referencing system. Then we get to the results section. So in terms of designing and recording data, if you are designing your own table, make sure you are literally drawing in the table lines. The number of times I've seen students who will write the headings and then, then they don't bother drawing in any lines or they don't use a ruler and it just looks really messy 
unprofessional and it's really hard to clearly see the data. Now, if you're creating your table on a computer, then that's not going to be relevant because it'll be automatically done for you. Then you should always have whatever your independent variable is in the first column. And in the second column or on the right hand side would be the dependent, which is what you're measuring. Always make sure you've got units in the heading as well. And you only put the units in the heading, not written next to every value in the table. Where I've said here headings are fully descriptive, what I mean by that is if you're measuring the time taken for, let's say a particular color change to occur, which indicates the end point of a reaction, you shouldn't just say time taken in seconds, let's say for your units, you should be saying time taken for the blue black color to disappear. Like you really describe the time taken of what. And lastly, when you are recording your data into your table, make sure that you are recording the numbers to the same number of decimal places in each column. Now this is in particular for biology. I know for chemistry, I think sometimes they have a particular set number of significant figures instead that you should be using. But for biology, you just need to make sure that you're picking an appropriate number of decimal places. And when I say appropriate, we're mainly considering if you have to plot this data on a graph, make sure you're picking an appropriate number of decimal places that you could accurately plot that value. You might be asked to present your data as a graph. So some considerations then for your graph. Make sure that both axes are labelled and they have the full heading and the units. And if you're plotting the mean of something, make sure you are saying the mean time taken for the blue black colour to disappear. Um, because you do have to emphasise it's the mean. You should always start your scale at zero and that is for the y and the x axis. If you then need to jump from zero to let's say 20, you could do a squiggly line which indicates I started at zero but now I'm skipping through all those values and beginning my scale at 20. And then you should increase by equal increments every single time. Now this next point is quite specific for biology. I don't think this is the case for all of the sciences. I think physics in particular is something slightly different. But for biology, if you don't have at least eight to 10 data points, then you don't have enough intermediate data points to predict a line of best fit. And therefore you should be doing your line as dot to dot with a ruler, unless your teacher has explicitly stated otherwise. And then finally, do not extrapolate past the first and the last data points. In biology, we only draw the line between the data points we have. We don't extrapolate down to zero. So processing of data, this basically means any maths you might have to do to better analyze and understand your results. That could just be simple processing, such as calculating a mean, or if it's a reaction, it might be calculating rates of reactions. You should, where possible, be doing a statistic, and that would either be your chi-squared, Spearman's rank, or student t-test. And then when you come to your conclusion with your statistical data, make sure your statistical conclusion includes the terms probability, chance, and whether or not you have a significant correlation or difference. Now, an overall conclusion gives a bit more detail than the statistical conclusion, because yes, you'd use your statistical data in a conclusion, but really you should as well describe some of the patterns, explain the data using scientific knowledge, and also consider the conclusion that you've come to, is it backed up by any secondary data? And you'd need to include references here of your secondary data. Now, this is a really thorough conclusion. You might not be expected to write it in that level of detail. So again, it's worth checking with your teacher. Let me print out this guide and just show them and just check. Do you expect this level of detail for this write-up? If not, which of these tick points do you want to see? Then is the evaluation. And again, you might not always have to include this, but this is where you're evaluating your method usually. So you need to consider the validity, accuracy, reliability of your results. So consider, did you have any anomalies? How close together were all of your repeats? That sort of thing. And you'll probably find, particularly if you're sharing class results, you may not have really similar results between the entire class, even though you followed the same method. And that is where we then need to consider, well, what were some of the limitations of the method then that meant we weren't getting reliable results? And once you've gone through those, you should also explain what the limitation is, why it would end up in you getting different results and suggesting an improvement for how to overcome that limitation. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the last point, suggestions for further work that could be 
improvements on the limitations of the method, or it could be something more you'd want to investigate to get a full conclusion. So for example, it could be a further experiment would be, I'm gonna test a wider range of pHs or smaller intervals of pHs. And lastly is the bibliography. So if you've done any research, which is competency five, you would need to make sure you are referencing where you got your information from. And that could be as a bibliography at the end, as well as indicating within your write-up where you used each source and follow the Harvard referencing system. So that's it. That's walking you through my guide of how to write up these required practicals, but you can use this when you get to university as well. So this is the general guide. You need to listen carefully to your teachers to know what level of detail according to this plan you would need to include. And as I said, it's linked in the description. So head there now, download it and start writing up these high quality lab reports to make sure you pass the practical endorsements. <laughs>